the burning question I have is now you've got this really important piece of research, what do you do with it? Um, once again, I'm not the author of the research, but from my perspective, what we do with the study and its findings is exactly what we're doing here tonight, and that is, I, I think its, its main purpose, Jen might correct me if I'm wrong, but was to really generate this sort of discussion and debate we're having here this evening about what is the future of Australian cities and you know what, what do we aspire to be, how will we compete on the global stage and having an, a, an independent assessment of where we currently sit on the global stage is a really important sort of stepping point um, you know, to truly believe Australia is a new world city, we need to understand how we're performing. Yeah, and, and I think it's um, sometimes we need to be reminded about how good we have it in this city. So a few things I think worth noting. One is there was discussion with that flywheel around clean air and innovation and education. That's something that Brisbane does very, very well. But I think the really standout piece in that whole research is the governance model that exists with Brisbane City Council. That 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 is enormous. I, I always wonder. I would have loved to be in the room in 1924 and see how they got those 20 towns and shires and cities together to say, yep, we're going to merge and this 20 mayors goes down to one. Imagine trying to do that right now. And that, that's, that's a, I think there's an interesting point to make there. If you look at Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide and Perth, they're probably never going to get all those people in the room. Mike Baird left, um, you know, a very successful Premier left New South Wales for a number of reasons, but one of them was that whole amalgamations of councils was very, very difficult for New South Wales, Jeff Kennett did it, and there's still more that needs to be done in Melbourne. So, you know, we're, we're in a, an amazing position here where we have this sophisticated council. Um, and I, I, I don't disagree with Ben much, and I, and, and I get where he's coming from with, with this idea around a Metropolitan Transit Authority, but why not give Brisbane City Council more power around that piece? Because there is the, the infrastructure there for them to do that. They run the buses very successfully, albeit that um, the state government owns and I would have thought that would be um, a, a great vehicle, pun intended, um, to bring all those uh, disparate public transport networks together. And, and, and you can only see the way that council acts in the South East Queensland Council of Mayors where it's a very collegiate organisation driven predominantly by Brisbane but bringing all those you know metropolitan councils together to make things happen. So. I think these pieces of research are really, really important. We're not going to hit all those things out of the park. I think we need to take some of the ones that we know, the low-hanging fruit that we know that we can implement um, and implement quickly uh, and bring the state and federal government on the journey with us as well. Thank you. Um, from the other side of the coin, something that really stood out for us at the Property Council was the piece about civic leadership and that it's quite lacking in Australia. So when we were talking to Greg Clark, he was like, people keep sitting back and waiting for governments to make decisions and to do something, but they're not going to. And our recent history shows they're really, really less inclined to do, the, to do that going forward. So that we as civic leaders actually need to work together to implement these outcomes. Because while there are a number of them that apply to government, unless we can band together as civic leaders to present a solution to government, they're not gonna do anything. So I guess what one of the first things that we did after receiving Greg's work was to look at this spidergram up here and to map it for Brisbane. And it showed some really, really clear strengths and then a few huge gaping holes. Like, for example, digital connectivity was a huge gap for us, um, as was the knowledge sector and innovation ecosystem. On the other side of it, like up here, higher education was a real strength of ours. So we mapped it based on the benchmarks that Greg presented. But then we went away and looked at all of the new great projects that are happening in Brisbane at the moment and then overlaid that on top of it and thought, do the things that are happening now or in the next few years, will they actually help to shift the dial on the spidergram for Brisbane? And if not, then what do we need to be advocating for going forward? So we pulled together a workshop of about 30 of the major project proponents and government and the city's transformation task force, Brisbane City Council, all those people in a room to discuss where we should go next. Um, and then as part of that conversation, Greg's takeouts for Brisbane, he actually picked out five of those 12 recommendations for Brisbane. 
So they were, just quickly, to make a deal, so to sort out the SEQ City deal, to strike infrastructure and growth compacts. So this is about whenever we have new growth areas to actually talk to the community to get combined public sector budgets for those growth areas so that the community knows when there is infrastructure coming and it's tied to a population trigger. The third one was to pivot to the knowledge economy. That's not just about the innovation jobs, it's really about the connectivity of precincts and creating the places for people. So places where, as Ben was saying before, that all of these tech people, the innovation economy, where they will actually want to live so we can keep those startups that they don't move overseas. The fourth one was about precinct partnerships and management. Again, this is about the civic leaders coming together as well to plan out how these precincts will grow and how they'll work with one another and to talk to government about that, to build some trust between the private and public sectors. And then his fifth and last recommendation for Brisbane was to cement Brisbane's place as a new world city. He likes the term, obviously. Um, but this was about building Brisbane's brand and helping to make us identifiable on a global stage. So things like 24-7 economy. So we are, as a property council, we're working through it at the moment, but we are keen to talk to more forums, talk to more people uh, to get their input on it as well. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm an academic. Uh, and so I'm used to writing things that, including things for government that people don't actually read and listen to and pay much attention to. We've just gone through an exercise that's been imposed on us for good reasons by the federal government to try and whereby we're expected to demonstrate the impact of our uh, research on the wider world beyond the academy. And uh, in my field, uh, so I run a research institute devoted to looking at all things to do with cities. That's relatively, relatively easy and straightforward conceptually. You know, I suspect that what will happen is that people will take it and they'll extract the bits from it that they like and that ring true to them um, or resonate with them and they will use it to advance their agendas and that's a good thing. I think at a, if, if you kind of move up the scale uh, to the national scale, it will it will nudge and push, uh, continue to give a bit of momentum to federal government a, a federal government inclination, uh, including this current coalition government, uh, to do something about cities, which I think is entirely commendable. Um, so I think it it will help in that regard, um, but I suspect that possibly in five years' time. Uh, we could be sitting in a room discussing another similar report by a similar, uh, what was there was a great phrase uh, that, that Greg himself had uh, produced, I think, uh, understanding cities is now a tradable commodity. Um, and, and I guess Greg exemplifies that um, very well, as does the eponymous Bernard Salt. Um, so I think the, the report is, is fantastic. It's a really good piece of research. It contains some really good insights. Um, and some of them will be used to advance an agenda that I think is valuable. Um, in terms of where we are here, I think one of the problems that I have with discussions about cities is, despite being notionally responsible for an institute uh, devoted to that, I'm, I'm never entirely sure what we mean by cities. So, for example, when I used to go to, over the last few years, a few events in Melbourne and before he encountered his uh, recent troubles, Mayor Doyle would um, always remind us that Melbourne had been voted yet again the world's most livable city. And I never quite knew whether he meant his jurisdiction, whether he meant Greater Melbourne, whether he meant Metropolitan Melbourne, uh, or what. And I think that there are, that presents significant problems, as people have already said, uh, for the governance of our um, uh, bigger uh, cities at that metropolitan scale. But I think what we do need to do is to look to the next stage and to look at SEQ as the significant thing. Now, whether you call it a city or not, I don't know. 
just because it, a city deal applies to it, I, I, I don't particularly care. But I guess what I do care about is if the component parts, the nodes that make up South East Queensland are treated and see themselves in isolation. That's just crazy. I spend most of my time working uh, on the Gold Coast and I know we've had exercises where we, you know, we get our pens out and we draw strategic diagram -y looking things um, that stop at Bean Lee. You know, and we go, well, we don't care what's happening north of that or south of the Tweed, because for God's sake, that's a different state. We don't want to go there, do we? Um, and that's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Um, but I think the challenge of uh, getting uh, an effective, and, and good luck to, the, to Comsec if, if they can pull it off. Um, and it's interesting, I think, that the, 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 the poster child of city deals in the UK was Greater Manchester. And part of the agenda of the City Deal Initiative when it was first introduced in the UK five or six years ago now, and I have to tell you that it's been superseded, they no longer talk about City Deals now, so the thing that we're copying now has been, has been long dropped in the UK. But one of the motivating factors was to try and force uh, metropolitan councils to get together voluntarily uh, and form some kind of federation. And in Manchester, they did it. They now have elected their first kind of super mayor for the Manchester metropolitan region, which is no bad thing. But there is a slight irony, because when I was studying urban policy and planning in the UK before I moved out here, the metropolitan county councils, including Greater Manchester, Merseyside, uh, the West Country, i.e. Birmingham, uh, and so on, were stripped of their metropolitan planning authority status by Mrs. Thatcher because they had the temerity to keep voting the wrong way. They ended up as little red blobs on a map that was in other respects entirely blue. So she abolished the very things that they've now had to work hard to reintroduce. So I think there's a, it tells you something about the circularity uh, and the life cycle of urban policy measures. One of the, one of the questions there is that, uh, as, a, as a repost and reminder to um, the importance of uh, the SEQ region is that uh, I remember uh, planning and working on the Sydney Olympics and having to trying to clean up Parramatta Road in the uh, late nineties. We had to deal with six councils just in one stretch of road, uh, just to manage you know advertising signs and you know public furniture, and uh, that was I think Sydney has crept its way down from 34 councils down to 20 something. So you have a five dock council merged into you know, South, si South Sydney. And when you talk of city of Sydney, city of Sydney really is a pocket handkerchief really in terms of the, the influence of, of Sydney. So the geographic center of Sydney is, is Parramatta and Liverpool really, but the economic powerhouse of Sydney is the you know, North Shore, Eastern suburbs and, um, and CBD and Barangaroo. Um, but you know, you talk about, um, and one of the other factors really here, I think with this work, is the, longitude, the, the benefit of longitudinal analysis. Keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. Uh, one of the best things down in Melbourne has been Jan Gell's work over 20 years in, in five-year kind of increments, coming back, remeasure, remeasure, where are we at? The key to these types of pieces of research are that it goes beyond the political cycle. So if you take something like place management, and I think... Greg Clark's marking Australia down, and I disagree with that to a certain extent because I think the private sector has picked up the place management and the place creating um, football and tucked it on its arm and run 100 miles an hour. It's something that councils and governments have been going on for years, and I think now you're just seeing the private sector. They see the value in it. And it's, ironically, I think property council probably 25 years ago did a piece of research around the value of design and what that meant from an economic perspective, but now we're we're genuinely seeing that on the ground. It's not just Len Lease doing it, it's, it's Mervex doing it. A lot of, you've got private developers like uh, Aria doing it in Fish Lane. You know, originally the, it, was the, it was the responsibility of government-led corporations like Southbank that delivered public space. Now, the private sector's in there doing it in a very big way. So, so if, you look at these, if you look at some of these key metrics that we need to continue to measure, I, I think it's the private sector that will need to pick it up and run very hard with it because politicians change and uh, we can't afford to stop and start every time there's a new government that comes in. These are, these are the types of things that... Yeah, and, that, and this is the beauty of cities, of continue to do what they do. So 
uh, just rams home the point around cities. And the private sector's got a very, very strong role to play in making sure that these things get delivered. I just want to invite comment on my challenge to the idea that bigger is better. There's a naive, for me, thread running through this that bigger makes it easier to be integrated and coordinate. I think we're seeing, for example, in Brisbane City, the political power of the middle and the outer suburbs leading to crazy projects like widening King Smith Drive in the pursuit of solving congestion. I think the big political entity works in a command economy where you haven't got as many political democratic rights as we say. And those are the sorts of pressures that don't exist nearly so much in smaller governments where people have to know people, where you can't hide behind the enormous structure. I just want to be optimistic, so please tell me I'm wrong. I was going to say, yeah, big, bigger isn't necessarily better, and I think from Brisbane's perspective, one of the great things about this city is that it hasn't been the size of Sydney or Melbourne, and that livability comes from our ability to get around more efficiently. I know I've got colleagues in our Sydney office that spend an hour and a half each way getting to the Sydney CBD, which is just not, I would have thought, a great way to live your life, um, whereas here, for the same price, you can live within five to ten kilometres of where you work, um, and that's always been a great advantage of it. And, and I would suspect that um, while Brisbane City Council, compared to a lot of others, is large, I think because of the 26 wards, there is a nimbleness and there's a there's a local localness about it, and um, I would hate to see that broken up. Um, there is a lot in that, absolutely. Uh, so I think it's that goes to the heart of what Greg Clark was saying in that Australia is now pursuing a low amenity, low livability future. That we can't continue to do things the way that we've done them in the past because we are changing, we're getting bigger, we can't keep doing the same thing and pushing things to the outskirts and just building more roads. Um, so in terms of big versus small, I mean, we look to Melbourne and the curation of their CBD, you know, they the politicians there can unashamedly focus on their CBD. They can put all of their funds into making sure that they have beautiful, consistent footpaths and public artworks. They don't have people out in the wards who are jumping up and down saying, but you haven't fixed my footpath out here. Whereas in Brisbane, you've got one councillor out of 26 in the CBD. So that's one voice out of the 26. So they do have that challenge. To Ben's point earlier about a transport authority for SEQ, like taking out of the way the TMR, the QR, the all of those independent silos and creating one overarching. I mean, size, I'm not so sure if size is the thing or if it is that we need our civic leaders to come together with a solution to take to government because they're not going to act unless they know that they're covered from the community, that they have that political coverage and they can't do that on their own. So I think that's where we are looking to implement some of this research to kind of come up with some solutions to help some of these challenges. Um, I, I think the, the, the challenge is to decide to determine which particular functions or area of government activity are best suited to being planned and managed at a broad scale and which at a narrow scale and, and that's an easy thing to say but it, when you come down to a list of things it's quite difficult. I mean I think you know the transit, the metro scale transit authority is a, is a sensible and fairly obvious one but then I go well that's fine but what about the economy? Would that not be, would it not be sensible to have a, an SEQ wide view of which areas uh, are best suited to different types of economic activity and which areas might be uh, the best recipients of certain types of investment and what about housing and what about cultural facilities you know you can't all have an opera house you can't all have a, a large theater or a sports stadium that can house 50,000 people so I think there are you know we can agree in principle that we want to separate some powers and responsibilities, but it's a real tricky challenge uh, to allocate them in practice. The other thing with, with the 
localism argument, which, which I'm kind of instinctively in favor of, is how you resolve the problem of, and I was trying to think of a phrase and I can't come up with anything better than localism gone bad. You give power to the people in the expect, well, you, you, you give it to the, to the people in the expectation that they will exercise it wisely and sensibly, but what do you do if, if in your view, they stop doing that? So where I lived and uh, when I was a student in London for a long time in the east end of London, um, London Borough Tower Hamlets, just across the river from me, had an exercise in decentralization, which was renowned. Um, they, they chopped up the borough into neighborhoods. They allowed uh, the election of representative, you know, little mini councils responsible for each of those neighborhoods. Um, the trouble was that some of those councils, from my point of view, uh, was that some of those councils then became dominated by political uh, members of the National Front who started introducing policies. So some of the jurisdiction that, that, that they had was over the allocation of council housing. So they started going, vote for us and we'll make sure that we don't allocate council housing to people that we don't think should get it. Right, first on the list, black people, you know. Second, we don't want any gay people here either. Uh, we'd rather not have single parents. You know, you go, well, I'm not sure who's left after. There's a, you know, a few white heterosexual you know, nuclear families left, but that's about it. But that was their policy. And they were voted in and they had the authority to do that. So that's a, that's a tricky thing if you, if you devolve power to, to the people and the people start to exercise that power in ways that you disagree with. So then you start saying, oh, you can only do it if you, if you uh, go down the path that we, we endorse and support. And we can, we're going to constrain your powers and limit your budget to such an extent that you can't really do anything. And then the, and then the local people get pissed off because they go, this is tokenism and you know, you're just allowing us to decide whether the, the grass in the park should be cut once a week or once a fortnight. You know? So that, that's a challenge. I, I don't know how we get around it, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an enduring and a long-term challenge when it comes to, again, deciding that balance between local and broader scale uh, governance questions. I might just add, I haven't had enough red wine to discuss politics with you, John, but um, uh, something I might add to that, uh, and I'm at risk of going on a rant here, so please snatch the microphone off me, but um, this idea of sort of popularist policy, um, you know, Brisbane City Council have recently won last Thursday night an award for engagement for their Plan Your Brisbane initiative, which was a great initiative and it was terrific engagement in how it reached out and attracted people who normally wouldn't come to a town hall meeting with their pitchforks and, and um, you know, share their views on, on development. But the outcome of that, which had a tremendous opportunity to be a growth management policy for Brisbane, it's been 10 years, I think, since we did the, um, the city shape exercise as a city and decided we wanted growth in, you know, close to public transport, again, Planning 101. Ten years on, we get this Plan Your Brisbane initiative. Winning awards on engagement, I can tell you, it will not win awards on planning policy. One of the initiatives is to increase car parking rates from a standing point which borrowed rates off the, off in 1970-something from a Californian-based planning scheme. Every other city in the world that is struggling with growth, that can see congestion and the issues that creates, is trying to reduce car parking rates. And because the people of Brisbane have spoken and want more car parking, they're getting more car parking. And as a planner, it's just a touch infuriating that you know we spend our days and nights at evenings like this talking about ways to manage growth appropriately. And we're getting decisions like that, which is not the community's fault. It's about having the dialogue and bringing them on the journey and genuinely engaging with them, which Again, that, that Plan Your Brisbane exercise had great opportunity, but I'm just really concerned that you know, it's gone in a direction that is probably failing us somewhat. Do you think potentially part of the challenge is that the you know, politicians or people haven't followed through on the infrastructure to go with the growth? So when we say we need less cars because there's going to be more public transport and they go, well, where is it? Been saying that for 20 years. I still don't have that bus route or I still don't have that train line. So it's that distrust that you talked about earlier on that it's hard to have conversations with the community when it's coming from this point of complete distrust of any decisions that are going to be made by a politician. 
Um, well, build to rent's a really interesting model. This is something that I know that um, the organisation I work for are in it in a big way in uh, the United Kingdom and about to launch it in a big way in America. There's phone books full of developers that just build apartments in in uh, American cities uh, for all different types of income levels. We still don't quite have the tax infrastructure set up here yet to do that. I suspect it's slowly starting to come. I know there were some changes recently around the stapled trust structures, which do help, but um, I don't. the metrics are getting closer. I know Mervex at the starting gate ready to go. I know we're, we're looking very hard at it. I, I think that will play, that's certainly going to play a part in it. Um, so one of the reasons that we're, our members are so keen on Build to Rent is the, the research that we've done on the younger generation is that they've pretty much given up on the dream of home ownership and they're happy to rent if it means that they can then travel, they can do all the other things that they want to do, they can just lock up and leave when they want to. So the Build to Rent model offers them that security of tenure long term. So some of our members like Len Lease over in the in the US and the UK, people rent with them, say they might rent an, a one bedroom apartment for five years, get married, move with that provider to another apartment in the same building that's slightly bigger, have kids and then move to a townhouse complex that's run by that same developer. So it provides that security of tenure. They don't have to own it, but they know that they're not gonna get chucked out because somebody wants to repaint it or because they're selling it or because their kid wants to move in. Um, but housing affordability more broadly, we believe is predominantly an issue of supply. I mean, you look at Sydney when they said, well, we're full, we are not unlocking any more land, we're done. And from there, we're still playing catch up. If you have a look at the apartment market in Brisbane, the reason that housing is affordable is because of supply. So fundamentally, it's about enabling supply to come online to keep the prices down? Um, yeah, I'll probably take a slightly different view. <laughs> I mean, I'm all in favour of build for rent, but partly because I spent some of my formative years living in uh, as a tenant of uh, initially the Greater London Council, and then when Ken Livingston decided to sell off their stock, uh, or pass on their, sorry, not sell, pass on their stock to the London Borough of Southwark, I became a tenant of them. Um, I think well-designed and well-managed uh, council housing, as I still call it, um, has, uh, it, it, hasn't, it hasn't had an especially good history, as I understand it, in Australia, but it, it could have a good future. So I'm all for build to rent, but not just by um, the private sector. I was hearing something the other day, and it gets, it's, a, it's a kind of story that gets repeated quite often, which is, uh, because it's, there's truth to it, which is that you go to Germany uh, and uh, the assumption that the only way to demonstrate your kind of impeccable bourgeois credentials is to, is to own property and to live in an owner-occupied dwelling just is, is, it's not that it doesn't exist, but it's just nowhere near as prevalent. You know, there are plenty of people who live in rented apartments until they get to kind of my age, um, and then they think, oh, I might now buy somewhere. And they do that because they c they've got security of tenure. There is minimal threat unless they behave, unless they trash the place or don't pay their rent, that they're going to be turfed out. They can modify, they can invest in, they can improve that property. And, you know, the places uh, in which they live um, have a reasonable chance then of forming the basis of a, of a half decent community. So I think we need that. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with Jen that. Uh, well, I have a different take on supply and, uh, and house, housing affordability. I think one of the problems with underlying housing unaffordability in this country is, is not a lack of supply of land, it's an oversupply of cheap finance that's been made available to immature investors. Um, and uh, this shifting of the balance in how we perceive housing uh, from, you know, we've, we've got the balance between its... its uh, use value and its exchange value to echo Marx um, out of kilter. So we think of housing simply uh, on the basis of its exchange value as a commodity and we forget that it's a place in which we live. You know, so people talk about rent being dead money. 
it's dead money apart from the fact that it's buying you a, a roof over your head. And if you've got security of tenure and the ability to uh, modify the interior of that dwelling, then it's a fantastic place to live. So it's 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 not dead at all. But we've we've incre you know we've come over the last 50 years to to see it in that way to our detriment. Um, so I don't think increasing the supply of land uh, is going to have a substantial effect on its own on uh, housing prices or housing, housing affordability. So a couple of quick points just to close out on, on that discussion. I, I, in my view, it's about supply of choice, which touches on the idea that you know, build to rent is a real option because not everyone will be able to own their own property or perhaps not initially. So having more choice in tenure, but also having more choice in product. I think in Brisbane, again, we're at this point in our life as a city where the ideal of, of a house in the suburbs with a mango tree in the backyard is one choice, or a 30-storey tower in West End is another. You know, we did reasonably well in the 70s and 80s, funnily enough, but in this day and age, we have very few good examples of you know, the missing middle as others have called it, and the SUQ regional plan tried really hard to, to bring that um, point up and get people starting to think about how we, how we do that sort of density good, do it well. Um, the other point I was going to make is often we think of, of density in apartments as being these, these terrible locations. The ABS statistics from 2017, the two most dense locations in Brisbane were the two most livable. New Farm and Kangaroo Point. It's where people want to live and they are the most dense in terms of population per square kilometre. So it wasn't West End, it wasn't South Brisbane where we're seeing all this change and all these cranes and towers. It was actually the suburbs that people aspire to be in and live in. And the reason for that is, is not the amount of towers, it's the amount of medium density. And I think if we saw more of that sort of product that's easier to deliver, we might um, go some way to, to, to supplying um, or, or addressing housing afford affordability with more supply. Um, a few of you will know that I've been threshing around this uh, paddock, the urban design paddock, for um, at least 40 years. And uh, regrettably, I wish I could say that I could see um, good progress. Um, now, one could say in the development of cities, um, 40 years is merely a blink. Um, well, that's true, and, and let's, let's hope that in the next 40, uh, we do see some, some real changes. Um, I don't want to offend uh, the Property Council's uh, research by saying, uh, I wish I'd heard something new. Uh, a lot of good work has been, and valuable work has gone into it, uh, but in the main, uh, in various parts, you know, wholly or partly, uh, pretty well all of those things have been said before. And yet, I think it's been acknowledged that we really seem to be still treading water. What seems to be coming through, um, you know, in the presentation of the, the research and, and the discussion is that changes are necessary and, and somehow we don't seem to be able to, you know, grapple with some of those changes. <clears throat> it might sound a little bit like kind of uh, out of left field, uh, but I would put it to you that it's what I'm going to say is absolutely central. In my mind, Australia doesn't have so much a drug problem or a, or a, a bullying problem or a needles in strawberries problem or a housing problem. We have a societal problem. Now, talking to a group of urban designers, uh, you know, most of you will say, ah, oh, well, yeah, maybe so. But the first thing to acknowledge is that uh, the city 
and society and community are both sides of the one and the same coin. Unless we understand that, um, you know, and many of you have heard me say many times, the city, urban design, is all about people. People is about society. Uh, we, as urban designers, uh, are not going to be able to, to re-engineer society. Uh, but I would earnestly put it to you that unless we at least acknowledge uh, that that is one of the main reasons why we don't seem to be able to, <clears throat> you know, get traction on some of these issues, uh, is that we also have a societal problem. It's interesting how serendipity uh, works, how convergence works. Like all good urban designers, um, I'll be traveling home by public transport. Um, so to, to pass the time, unfortunately, I don't have very far to go. Uh, but I took a book with me. Well, lo and behold, uh, I didn't realize when I took the book with me that it would be really quite central to this function. Hugh McKay, some of you may have heard of his name, Hugh McKay, to me, is uh, an absolute national treasure. He's written many books, most of which are quite germane to what all of us are trying to do in our various ways. Um, and yet, I wonder how many urban designers have read much of what Hugh has had to say about society and about um, the built environment, the setting we make for human life. Um, I get no thanks from <laughs> Hugh <coughs> or any, any commissions, uh, but um, quite unabashedly I will push Hugh's latest book called Australia Reimagined. Um, so just to round out, uh, unless we at least realize that in our own, however small a way, individual way, <clears throat> uh, unless we address the fact that many of our issues are, uh, that we don't seem to be able to handle uh, are, are rooted in the state of our present day society, um, these kind of conversations, uh, frustrating as they are, will continue taking place uh, in another 40 years time and probably, hopefully not, but in another 40 years again. I think you're being way too hard on yourself. Um, you're a pioneer in this space, in this urban design space, I, uh, you know, in, the, in, in that 40 years. And um, just recently, uh, we're, Len and Lisa working on the Cross River Rail bid and I'm heavily involved in the Roma Street bid and I just, it just, I'm just, flabbergasted at the amount of infrastructure that dissects through Roma Street and Albert Street and the, and the absolute lack of any thought that came that comes with people. You talk about people and I think the work that you've done and others have done um, for many, many, many years, those over those 40 years has mean today, I think we get much better place outcomes than we did in the 70s and 80s. You know, the freeway that, that, that cuts off the city um, along uh, North Bank, as it's once known, it just would not happen today. You're looking at things like Howsmith Wharves. I don't know if you've ever been down to the Jellyfish Restaurant, but that was the truncation for a freeway on the other side of the river until um, Sally Ann Atkinson and I think Len Lease at the time got together and said, hey, we shouldn't be turning our back on the river, we should be embracing the river. I, I, I think we're very fortunate as a city that there's been people like you that have been advocating for good design, good urban design, people-related design. I think we've got a lot better results on the back of that, whether it's South Bank, whether it's the boardwalk along that stretches all the way. You know, there's a lot of residents around New Farm that didn't want that boardwalk that stretches all the way from Breakfast Creek now to the University of Queensland. Um, you know, you've got private developers now creating places that, aren't, that, are, that are activated day and night. So I, I think as a city, 
We are very, very fortunate. Yet we've got our issues, but we have come a long, long way in that 40 years in terms of designing places for people. Thank you for um, inviting me here tonight and uh, me being able to speak now in, the, in a conversation raised by a most interesting study, which I, I found quite fascinating and I hope it'll be published and uh, a lot of other people will be able to have some say about it. I have a question for the panel and that is, who has responsibility for the long-term quality of development in Brisbane? Is it the private sector or is it the government? I think as the uh, only practicing town planner on the panel, I feel obliged to go first. Um, look, it sounds like a lazy response, but I think we all have a responsibility to demand good design. I think as residents, you know, with more supply comes more choice, so we can vote with our feet and decide which developments, you know, we want to live in because of the quality of the design and the experience that creates for us. I think as professionals, you know, we have a duty to educate clients and also you know vote with our sort of pens or, or hands as we now design things um, in that we don't have to accept every project um, developers have a responsibility to ensure that their projects are things that the entire city can be proud of and ultimately government are the gatekeepers they're the decision makers so they write the rules against which developments are assessed and ultimately approved or refused. And the great challenge with you know, performance-based planning, I think, has delivered some terrific outcomes in this city. But the great challenge with trying to codify what is effectively you know, this aesthetic quality, you can't make it a quantitative measure. You can't say a five metre setback equals a good building. Um, the real challenge with that is ultimately the planning system finds itself designed in a manner that is trying to protect against the bad. It doesn't necessarily foster or encourage the good. So we end up with this, you know, if you tick the box, you get your approval, but it's not necessarily a high quality outcome. And, you know, I, I take your point. There are some examples in the city that I'm not proud of as a citizen. Um, thankfully, I haven't worked on, on them, but... Um, I think we do have a long way to go and you know, I gave them a, a touch up before, I'll give them a compliment. Um, one of the actions out of the Brisbane Blueprint was to um, develop a design office and they haven't come out to explain exactly what that means. I don't believe it's a city architect but it's about having a greater focus on the quality of design in the city so f on that action Brisbane City Council should be commended. Yep. Look I, I agree as someone from the development industry there is a lot of rubbish out there, there's no doubt about that. Um, and I think council, and I might have to agree with John, maybe bigger isn't better, John, John Byrne with council on this front. They, they haven't been fantastic when it comes to design. I don't, I, and I don't think it's top of mind for them. I think in previous administrations, there was a bit more of a focus. I think the state government's probably been a bigger driver of good design rather than council. I think council are very much um, it's a doer attitude, let's get it done, let's get it approved, yep, that looks good. But yeah, it's the apartments are hard, there's a number of architects here, apartments are tough. They the, have to be the toughest um, use to design really well. I think we've got a fantastic group of architects and there's a, there's a, uh, we've got a unique subtropical design uh, experience in this city and we don't see enough of it and, and it would be great to see Brisbane City Council encourage that a bit more. Uh, I just wanted to add that I think it's yes there is there is definitely some poor design out there but there's also some really incredible design and some people are doing amazing things there is a real focus on people and places every day when i'm talking to our members they're talking about how who they're designing for how they're designing they're partnering with all different unlikely allies to come up with great places and spaces for people so it's really hard when there is rubbish out there which detracts the the conversation and makes it really difficult for the people who are trying to do the right thing. So, I mean, I don't know who's the ultimate, it is council at the last hurdle, um, but unfortunately there will always be people who are in to make a quick buck, but then at the other end of the spectrum, there are people who have invested in our city and continue their long-term investors and want to see great outcomes. I think that question about um, who's responsible 
principally for the long term is a is a really tricky one um, and I guess it's at the moment there seems to me to be little cause for optimism that that we can look to our elected politicians from whatever level of government uh, in the expectation that they're able to raise their sights above the their electoral cycle so that's a that's a tricky thing and the thing that worries me a bit and it it always comes out when you see the kind of listings of, of cities or you have discussions about places that have done things well is is that you know Singapore's always there Hong Kong's there and China more generally um, because and, and if you look back in history as well you go well what are the things some of the things that have produced urban landscapes that we'll now pay a lot of money to go overseas and admire and walk around and, and they're the products of uh, not of community participation and in public participation and engagement and democratic approaches to planning. It's Napoleon III saying to George Houseman, go and do it. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of powerful men usually kind of commissioning other people to do what they think is good on their behalf and the public can, you know, go to hell in a handbasket really. And, and I don't know if we're ready for that, although some people would, would say, uh, I'll have a bit of that Singapore action, thank you, if, if that's what it takes. That worries me slightly, um, but I can see that it might actually, somewhat paradoxically, give you some good outcomes. There's a man at the back who looks very desperate. He's been waving his arm. Uh, just before we take the last question, there are some really positive examples um, over in London. For example, the King's Cross development, which is a big participatory engagement with the community on all sides, three different councils, delivering 48% social housing, 52% commercial, uh, and structured around pure public space uh, for people who live outside of the development. Um, there are other examples as well, but that one in particular is noteworthy because it was delivered by Argent, a good developer, and largely on the back of Australian super, which is rather sad. Hi there. Um, just a quick question. Um, well, you know how Brisbane tried to bid on the Olympics? I don't know what year that is they tried to do it. So following on from the Commonwealth Games, and do you see if, say, Brisbane, do you win the Olympics or try to beat the Olympics? And basically, I'm just trying to say, infrastructures-wise, the planning-wise, public transport-wise, will be a better outcome for us, or are we going to be in debt, so to speak? Um, if we do win the Olympics, do we think the legacy of 20 years after that, Brisbane would be a like, great world city? I can take that question as being involved in a couple of Olympic bids uh, and, uh, and Commonwealth Games. Uh, one of those, it's often said that uh, if Brisbane was considering it, that it would have to be a regional um, focus. That if, uh, and the other factor is that the Olympics itself is looking at the viability of the Olympics and the Olympic kind of host city model more, more widely. It's, uh, it's been said that uh, I think they are having a bit of a hold, cold, hard look at themselves in terms of what it takes, in terms of you know five to ten to twenty billion dollars worth of investment. You know what what's our natural kind of starting point? Could we ever get a regional a regional bid? Could we ever not try to gild that lily beyond which we could afford to pay and put in? a bid based on a, a reasonable business case for for sustainability do we have enough do we need to have the hundred thousand seat stadium and you know five and five or six of them when our natural kind of ca carrying capacity for stadiums is around the 50 60 thousand seater kind of mark for a, a, a city like like brisbane I think even Sydney struggles to fill Homebush, you know, more than a couple of, couple of times a, a year. So they're even now looking at more boutique stadiums, you know. And so if we could think about what that, what that is, but an Olympics is more than the sport itself. It's a cultural event and it's a, you know, it's a brand for the city. And so those things get factored into the business modelling of it. But I think that we would have to really... Uh, you don't want it just to be for the prestige of the mayor that nominates it at the time. That's the, that's the risk. 
is that we think that we want an Olympics because someone says, oh, I did it. Do we want it? I don't hear a kind of a screaming ground cell to say that we would like to, like to do it as Sydney in 1992. I speak as somebody who wore a uh, star-spangled top and wielded a lightsaber at the closing during the closing ceremony of the Commonwealth Games. I think it was fantastic for the Gold Coast. Uh, if I was Brisbane or SEQ, I wouldn't go anywhere near the Olympics with a lightsaber. Um, just finally on the research, um, as Ben put up on the slide, the four complete papers are available on our website and so is the summary document, and there's a print copy of the summary document here as well. Um, but if you do want to touch base with me afterwards, find out anything else that we're doing on this front, happy to chat to you. I think we're doing a lot of fantastic things in this city, and I think um, I'm very excited about its future, but we can certainly do better in a whole raft of areas, and it's pieces of research like this that really help us improve what we're doing. You've stolen mine, I've got nothing else, thanks. Great. Please join me and thank our speakers.